Right before I left, though, I had an opportunity to run on a treadmill probably a week or two before I left. And so I, I tried to see what I could do in a 5K all out. So I, I can actually remember that day. Um, it was in August and... What is next? Will you be leaving college uh, this year and going pro? I, I want an answer to that, too. Um, I mean, it talk about more times than I probably um, would care to admit. Hello everyone, as you can hear, the computer is humming, which can only mean one thing, another interview, and right now, Zoom is converting the meeting to a recording. Today, I spoke with Connor Mance, who is a runner at BYU, and recently just won the NCAA Cross Country Championships. Connor and I discuss everything from his high school career, which included qualifying for the World Junior Cross Country Championships, where he competed against. We discuss his NCAA Cross Country Championship win. Is he allowed to run on Sunday because he is a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? And if runners at BYU run on Sundays, we talk about how he was able to come back from his mission in Ghana and get back to training at a high level and if he was able to train while in Ghana. And he had one of the best answers to the Taco Bell question. Today's inquiry of the episode is going to be what runner, past or present, uh, inspires you the most? As you can see, I have Steve Prefontaine next to me today. This is a new setup and also the tree because today is Earth Day. A runner that is actually a big inspiration to me is Jake Riley. I had the honor to speak with Jake a few months ago and today's interview, Connor will share a lot of knowledge with you guys and so I really hope you enjoy. But thank you so much for watching and enjoy the interview. Timestamps are in the description, so if you want to skip forward to a segment that is more interesting to you, I know some of his answers are a bit lengthy at times, but I really encourage you to watch all the way through because I think you could take a lot out of it. So here is my interview with Connor Mance. I'm joined today by Connor Mance. Connor, how are you doing today? Doing well. Doing really well. I just finished my last final yes last night, so happy that school's over for the semester. Wow, you are that's very lucky. I still have to go until June for my school year, which is uh, quite depressing to think about. But uh, let's begin. Um, you grew up in Smithfield, Utah and uh, it has a population of about 10,000, elevation uh, 4,600. So you attended Skyview High School, and if your high school is called Skyview, I would imagine that that was a pretty beautiful place to grow up. Yeah, totally. It just, um, it's in a beautiful valley called Cache Valley in northern Utah, and I don't know, it's not very... Uh, it's pretty rural for the most part. There are, are like we have Utah State University not too far away, and it's just a nice area. Terribly cold winters. I think that's why it's um, a lot of people don't move there. But yeah, grew up there. Great trails, great places to run, and great tons of outdoorsy stuff to do just all around. So it's uh, it's a beautiful area. Lots of agriculture too. Let's begin uh, where you first began running. So what age did you first take up running and what did you think about it? So when I was, oh, it was probably like when I was 10 or maybe even 10 to 12, I did, I started doing like a little, a couple of local 5Ks, not like training for them, but like 
I just asked my dad if I could race and he's like, oh, sure. Like, why not? And then when I was 12 years old, um, and this is kind of an unconventional path. I don't know if I'd recommend it. Like there was never a track program or anything for junior high or middle school or elementary school where I lived. So, um, my dad was actually training for some marathons, trying to lose weight. And I thought that was pretty inspirational. So I wanted to do a, I, I decided to get into half, try to do a half marathon when I was 12. And, um, my dad just kept being like, Hey, yeah, I'll like, I'll let you do it, but you got to train for it. You can't just like, this isn't just like our local 5k that happens once a year. This is like, um, you know, half marathons a lot farther. You got to make sure like you train for it or else it's going to be kind of a bad experience. So I started running a little bit, trying to train for the distance. And then um, I ran my first one when I was 12 years old. I went, that uh, was like an hour 30 or something like that. Um, probably a slower than that. But um, after that, I, I started really, I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. And I was like, you know, I want to do another one of these. And so my dad let me do two a year until I was in high school. So I was doing um, half marathon probably every about every six months. And it was just a lot of fun to just like not only challenge the distance, but I mean, I was growing at the time. I was getting faster, like a lot quicker after every, or after every one, I was able to drop a lot of time. So it was kind of a fun experience. Definitely unconventional, though, because it was like I was training for half marathons and road races and then you know you get to, I got to high school and all of a sudden it's I'm training for the mile I'm training for the two mile I'm training for cross country or the 800 and you know that's a lot different than I mean it was all the same type of training to me but like it's a lot different racing now like looking back on it thinking like man I was trying to run a good mile and I was trying to run a good half marathon and I don't see those two distances as similar at all <laughs> Yeah. Uh, usually people will, you know, start with running a mile, trying to race like a mile or two, and then maybe it'll bump up to a 5k in high school. And then in college, you might be running the 10k and then after college half marathon, but that's certainly impressive that you were able to drop a 130 or whatever you ended up running, but, uh, very impressive. And did you grow, uh, when you were growing up, did you play any other sports? Yeah, I, I um, did soccer and swimming. Um, I wasn't fantastic at either of those, I, but I don't know. I had a lot of fun with it. My parents always encouraged me to try new sports out, I think. Um, just like every other kid in elementary school, they put me on a, 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 just a team for everything. And then I liked soccer, so I stuck with that until um, until I was in high school, honestly even though I was, you know, doing all these half marathons and 5Ks, 10Ks on the road, it was like, oh, like soccer was what I, what I trained for and what I did for the most part. It was like the K, like every other day I'd go for a run, but soccer was kind of my, I don't know, I wasn't great at it, but I was good enough to have some fun with it. So moving on to high school, uh, could you walk us through your high school training progression? Just like, you know, very general with, with like uh, miles per week and stuff like that. All right. Um, so my my high school coach, when I came in, he had taken third at state the year beforehand. Um, so they were I was at a good program, but they were very different um, than most programs are now. And I think I just think they didn't have, I don't think my coach had as much like invested in it. He was also the wrestling coach and, you know, he, he coached some good athletes, but, um, we weren't like a stellar team by any means that third place came out of nowhere. And so I came on the team the next year and we were doing like probably four workouts a week. We work out, um, we do a workout Monday, we'd race on Wednesday, do a workout Thursday, do a workout Friday, easy run Tuesday, and then maybe a run Saturday and no, no running Sunday. So it was a very speed based program. It was, we were super high intensity my first year, which was, um, which I think is, you know, very, very different than what I do now. And so I was only running about 25 miles a week with the occasional, maybe 30 mile a week, my freshman year. 
um, but I was competing at a high level is, you know, there's more than one way to get in shape. And so we were doing these, um, I remember doing workouts where it was, oh, we did tons of hill repeats. I remember doing one in the morning. We would go at like 6 a.m. on Thursdays. Um, I don't know why we went, or we only went early one day a week, but we went 6 a.m. on Thursdays and it's like almost pitch black outside. Everyone's carrying like a flashlight and we're doing these like hill repeats through the woods. <laughs> And you're just like, the brush is all over and you're just like going up and it was just kind of fun. Um, but then it's like, I, I, I was really successful that year. I ended up taking second at state individually. Team was fourth that year. We didn't do as well. Um, and I, th I took second, but I was a half second ahead of, or behind first. And I was 0.3 seconds ahead of third. So I was like right in the middle of these two guys in cross country. And it was like a huge, um, it was a big moment for me. Cause it was just like, I had been third at our regional meet heading into the state meet. And um, it was kind of a, a big moment because it was like, Oh, like this is like a big race. Like I performed on a big day and it made me realize, Oh, like what's after state. And somebody was telling me, Oh, there's Foot Locker nationals. I was like, okay. Like, that's what I want to train for. So I go to the regional and I'm, um, I run as hard as I can. And I'd never had it in a race where like I hadn't, if they had medals where I hadn't gotten a medal or if they had like an awards where I hadn't gotten an award, whether it was for age group or, um, just finishing. And I was 25th in that race and they split up the medals to first team is top eight. Next eight is second team. Next eight is third team. So he had it all up. 25th doesn't get a medal. He's the first guy out. So I waited to get my little paper that was going to get me a medal. And then they're like, oh, what are you doing? Like, keep walking through. Like, there's a line of people. Um, and this was just at the finish. I was like, oh, like, okay, that's kind of embarrassing. But um, it was those two moments that I think really got me super invested in the sport because um, I realized, okay, like, I'm good. But I'm also like, there's so much more and I'm, you know, and then the next year I was like, I don't just want a medal. I want to make for locker. Nationals. And so, um, I started doing more research. My coach, um, also started doing research on good training methods. So we stopped working out, um, like three times a week with a race on a race week. And we began to do more like, we began and my coach got into the Jack Daniels, like V dot chart stuff. And we upped my mileage. I got up to like, I think I hit like a high 40, um, while training for Foot Locker regionals that year. So in my sophomore year, I was able to make, um, Foot Locker nationals. I took 12 that year. And that was also like an eye opening experience. Like, Oh, there's so many opportunities to race. Well, and you compete with like these amazing athletes and, it was also really fun because it was like, um, I got to go to California twice that year to just compete. That That's fun, you know? And so as time went on, it was like more and more like, um, I just wanted it like that much more. And I was like, okay, I'm going to train harder because I want to win this race. I'm going to win nationals. And my, my body wasn't ready for it. And I was doing training at such a high intensity with, um, eventually getting my miles up to 60 miles a week where I ended up getting a stress reaction, to my femur. And then I was out for a good six weeks out for that season. I, I still competed at state, but I was hurt. And, um, it was a bummer. I, I took second. I was in the lead until probably 10 meters to go, 20 meters to go. And then I tripped and <laughs> the guy passed me. Um, so I took the same place in state my senior year and my freshman year. It's kind of, interesting to think about but um as time went on it just became like I had to in high school I think my senior year I I had gotten too competitive with myself that I began overtraining and so I kept getting either her or have little setbacks and um I think that was like a big trial for me just because my senior year was like I had some pretty amazing races but then I was like I would have some bad races and I couldn't like, I couldn't have good races all the time. It was like really inconsistent. 
And I think that was just because I was overtraining. I was burnt out. And then I'd it would either be like out of the park or a strikeout. Um, using a baseball analogy. <laughs> so that was my uh, that was my high school experience. Kind of a long um, long go there, but yeah. That, but that was really well told, and I think a lot of lessons uh, were learned, and I think a lot of people can learn from uh, your experience. But you ended up qualifying for the 2015 World Junior Cross Country Championships in China uh, while you were still in high school. What was this like? And um, like, did it change you as a runner at all? Um, all right, I'll go over the first question. So it was it was honestly like one of the coolest experiences of my life, um, even now, because I got to compete with um just tons of great athletes and people from all over the world i got to travel um before that i travel all over the states for races and um a few times i'd gone like i think my family had gone to california a couple times for family vacations but now all of a sudden i traveled to uh, um before that i got to travel to columbia as part of that team and compete there and then to china it was it was amazing um just a really cool experience to just go and compete with the best, especially because like now I can look back and see who was in the race with me and who I competed against. I mean, that, that, that is kind of a cool thing to look back on and see like how good some of these people are. And it's kind of inspiring. Like, um, I think Joshua check, the guy was in my race. Um, Morgan McDonald was there. Uh, the Swiss athlete was there. I cooled down with him. Julian Wanders was there. That's the guy. Um, John Dressel was there he and Eric came are pretty good friends with them still. Um, there was, there was a bunch of guys like Rory Linkletter who ended up being my college teammate, Justin Knight. I think I might've already said him and it was cool to be there and like compete with these guys. And then I look at that okay, and be like, man, like, yeah, sure. Some of them smoked me in that race, but it's like, man, some of them are like, they're the best in the world. And that's kind of a cool thing for, for me. Um, I think you, did you ask what I, what I learned from that experience or what was that? Yeah. And how, how did it change you as a runner? Uh, I think it, it got me back to being a lot more humble because like, I, I thought, okay, like, cause that year I won the U S um, junior championships by, I think it was like 25 seconds or something like that. It was like by quite a lot to qualify for that team. And then I go to the world junior championships. I think, the winner was something like a minute and a half ahead of me. And it was like, okay, like I'm good, but like a minute and a half, that's a lot of time. And so it kind of was like, okay, I'm not, I have a long way to go. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of things that need to be changed. Um, but at the time it was kind of like, oh, okay. Like, I don't know, learned a lot. Just got to always stay humble. Um, there's always going to be somebody better, somebody to chase. I just work on that. That uh, would definitely just be like the experience of a lifetime. I think for anyone just getting to travel uh, to compete on such a high stage would be incredible. And then before uh, going to college, you went on your mission. Uh, I'm going to butcher the name, but Accra in Ghana. Yeah, it's like Ghana Accra. Uh, so you were close. You were close. <laughs> um, so were you able to do any running during these two years? And how did it affect your running? There was recently a debate on Let's Run, I believe, about if uh, LDS runners were able to uh, train during their mission. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure that. I feel like I, I always hear that that's on Let's Run. Um, so we're able at the time, um, now the rules have changed a little bit more that give more leniency, but we were supposed to like, you're supposed to do some daily exercise for about 30 minutes a day when I was out. But if you're not with your companion, you can't go out for a run. Like he has to be there to be within sight and sound of each other at all times, except when um, one of you is in the bathroom. And so 
for me, I didn't run very much. I, I did run a lot more than most missionaries get to. So in my first area, I was probably, you, you move every, um, you can be moved every six weeks. It doesn't mean you will be moved, but there's a chance. And for me, I probably the first like four or five months, I was able to get in a good three miles on probably four or five days a week. And then it changed for the next six months or four months. It was probably two miles. And then after that, it was pretty much like nothing. Um, near the end, I started I was able to run with a companion. I found that when you're with your companion, um, if the companion, like you switch your companion almost every six weeks. And when you're with one who wants to lose weight, they're more like likely to run with you than somebody who doesn't. And so I got a few companions who were just like, yeah, like I'll run, like I'm kind of chubby and I want to lose weight. And so I'd run with some and we'd probably run a mile in 10 minutes and that'd be about it. Um, and so it, it was, it's difficult. I did a lot of push-ups, sit-ups, planking, or like lunges um, while sits. Just kind of like overall stuff that get you like, keep you fit. But nothing that was like going to get me like in good running shape. Um, right before I left, though, I had an opportunity to run on a treadmill probably a week or two before I left. And so I, I tried to see what I could do in a 5K all out. And... Um, it was in an air conditioned room, flat as could be, because I didn't want to do any elevation gain. Um, and so I raced, I time trialed the 5K, and I think I did like 1740 or 35 or something like that. And it about like, it took me out. Like, I was coughing so bad. I was just like hands on my knees for like probably a good 20 minutes. And the rest of the day, I'm just drained, which isn't what you're supposed to be doing as a missionary. No, you're not supposed to work out so hard that you're exhausted and so um yeah i gotten i was not in um near the shape i was in high school I mean, my high school personal best in the 5k was like 14 24 so i was that gap had definitely formed to be a lot bigger um and so it was you know but or let me go back and so um even looking back on it if i had to do it again I don't think I would change very much because it was like, you don't train very much as a missionary and that's not your purpose. Like I didn't go to Ghana to get in good shape. I didn't go to Ghana to, you know, be a good runner when I got back. And there were points while I was out there in the middle where it was very frustrating um, because I, in the first eight months, I gained about um, 30 pounds and it was just tough. Cause it was like, first like five months I lost, I just lost muscle and gained like fat my weight didn't change and then those next three months it was like just started putting on the pounds and um I, I stress ate a lot because it was just kind of a stressful work and um I don't know it was tough because in a different country where like people are have a completely different culture and you just, sometimes you just don't think you can um it's hard to relate to people and it's hard for people to relate to you so you kind of just feel alone sometimes um which i mean brings you closer to god but some of those days it was just tough and so it was during those points i think i just it was really frustrating because it was like i was out of shape and then um i remember praying one day and just you know being like heavenly father like i'm gonna give my all to you um, do what I can, but, you know, if there's any chance that when I get back, um, you can help me to, you know, get in shape again, like, please let that happen. And if not, like, yeah, I know running might not be for me. That may have been a thing. Like I'll just do all of high school and after in college, it might not work out, but I'll, I'm going to give everything to you and then let you decide on what happens next. And I think at that moment is when things were to improve um, on the mission. I was just happier. And then um, as time went on, it be also became like um, I started losing weight. I don't, by the time I got back, I was only 20 pounds heavier than I was in high school, as opposed to the 30 I had gained in you know the first eight months. And so it was like um, it was just it was just kind of cool to see that. And then 
getting back from the mission again, shape and be traveling with the team after only six months or so. Oh, Sorry, so that was probably longer than you wanted with that that's, question. That's totally fine. But uh, I appreciate you sharing that experience because I, I mean, I didn't really know what would be happening uh, in terms of running and stuff like that. So I think um, a lot of people will appreciate hearing that and people who are not really familiar with uh, LDS mis- missions um, will uh, enjoy learning about that. But um, when you first got back to the U.S., I know you just said that within six months you were back traveling with the team, but how did you react to the training and uh, was it a struggle to get back into it or did it all go uh, fairly smoothly? Um, it was definitely difficult. I think the coach Eyestone knows how to get people in shape, especially coming back from missions because BYU um, is supported and funded by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So when most, like, I'd say probably on our men's team, probably a good 70% of the guys will serve missions. And so he knows what it's like to get people in shape. He himself served an LDS mission, came back, and was a four-time national champion and two-time Olympian. And so the coach I still knew – knew how to get me in shape, knew how to get everybody in shape. It just took time. For me personally, it was very frustrating though because it was like all the guys I'd raced in high school who um, I had seen myself almost as better than were all of a sudden like national caliber athletes. And I was the 15th guy on the team where even if I was, um, even if I was, if there wasn't a red shirt, I would probably, I wouldn't be traveling because I wouldn't be good enough to make our travel squad. And so it was really frustrating to see that and have to go, you know, day by day. Workouts were just tough. Easy runs were hard. Everything just felt exhausting. And I just would go to, like, I'd fall asleep probably 9.30 every night, just totally drained. Um, There's also a huge difference going to college, just being away from home, but in the States and trying to figure out how things work here again. Because in Ghana, I mean, you have you have shops everywhere. You can buy, like you can go out your door and go down the street a half a block and there's somebody selling food. And so you can like order anything to make food, they're like little provision shops. And so like here it was like, oh, like I don't have food. Like what am I supposed to do? Like, oh, there's a restaurant, but I don't really want to spend that much money on food. Like how do I like... Like it was just kind of difficult, and then scheduling time between class, running, and everything. I think that was all really hard early on, and so like there, especially the first couple of weeks, there were a lot of days I just missed meals, and I mean maybe it was a good thing because I lost a lot of weight, but it was like <laughs> just exhaustion, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like. It was not a smooth process, but I was very fortunate because I got up, I built my mileage back up to probably 70 miles a week higher than I ever did in high school, probably two months after being home, maybe three months after being home. And so that was a, an interesting thing because, um, I started like 15 miles the first week and then 20 and then 25 and then 35 and it was a slowly slow build process, but um, I was very fortunate to not get hurt. And that I think I may have been a little too risky and got a little too excited. But um, I started doing some way higher mileage than I ever did in high school. And by uh, January, I was traveling with the team and I had gotten back July 5th. So it was not that long of a transition time, but it felt long at the time. It felt like I was never going to get back to being in shape and feeling good on a run. So, you know, moving on, uh, before you won the national cross country meet this year, uh, you were 10th in NCAA cross country as a freshman, third as a sophomore. So um, what accomplishment were you most proud of? Um. I think, I mean, maybe it sounds cliche. I think, you know, the the taking the 
taking first this past year, I was really proud of because I think I had overcome a lot of obstacles um, more so this time. And then I was during the race, I was more um, I was more focused on the team aspect, I think. Um, in 2019, yeah, we, we ended up winning as a team and I took third, but I was so focused on, you know, I got to be top three. I got to win this for, or win this for myself. And in 2018, um, it was also a very team like oriented aspect, but, um, I'm very proud of that day as well. I think every, every season had a little, um, I don't know. Every season had something special about it, but this this last one especially. So I had two bone injuries in the last, in like the year and three months leading in, up to the meet. Um, with the cancellations, that also kind of hurt because it was hard to get motivated for a race that might not happen. And yeah. I I jumped into all these races that. I shouldn't have because it was like I wasn't prepared but it was like who knows when a race is going to happen so it was like I jumped into 5k's and 10k's starting workouts two weeks beforehand and it was yeah I don't know lots of cancellations sorry I interrupted you you can go no, on no it's okay uh how did you first react when you heard that uh these last NCAA cross-country championships were being moved to March so I, I can actually remember that day um it was in August and there was a sound running was putting on a 10 K in LA, LA and a few of my teammates who had, who were running professionally were going to it. And so I, um, when it got canceled, I called the coach. I and was like, Hey, like I want to race this meet, like, just let me go in and run it. Like I want, I might not have another race until like, January, February, March, and we don't even know if those are happening. And so I went and raced um, the sound, that sound running 10K in August, going in pretty unprepared. And I think I was very unprepared, like mentally as well. Like I wasn't ready to race. And so I got went into the race and I just like hit halfway um, or hit two miles, probably way too quick, slowed down a lot. Um, got past just past halfway by the group that was sitting on me and then just kind of came back and worked my way up sorry I don't think you want to hear about that whole race but um, it was just trying to find a race and it was frustrating and I think I at that point in time I was like well when it comes I'm going to be in such great shape and so I did like six weeks at 104 or higher for miles per week and that's not smart that's not smart for me at least and I had a stress reaction in my femur and I was out for eight weeks and it's like great like I might as well have averaged 50 miles a week this past six to eight week or past 14 weeks um so I didn't react the best way, but I kept working, whether it was on a bike, whether it was in the pool and eventually as I was running. Yeah. I was just going to ask how you, uh, like how you had to adjust your training, but it sounds like, uh, it didn't maybe get adjusted the best way or the, at least the way that you wanted it to. Um, yeah. but so, uh, why don't you just like walk us through, that NCAA cross country championship win. Um, and like, what was going through your head during the race? I know, you know, when I was watching it, I, I didn't, I did not have confidence that you would win. Um, to be honest, I thought that like you had gone out too hard or, you know, you tried to take, take the lead too early. And I was just really surprised. It was really cool to see that you held on. So why don't you walk us through that race? All right. Well, well, thanks for your confidence. <laughs> I just, uh, it was, it was a great, uh, it was a great race for me. Um, it seemed like things went perfect as far as they could. We started out and yeah, it felt really quick. I don't know what that first 800 was, but I wish I knew because I remember turning 
the sharp left and then we were running into the wind and we slowed down a lot and I decided I was going to go with Kip too. Um, probably about six, 700 in. Cause I knew he was the, he was the guy after that 5k indoor at indoor nationals. It was, he was the man that was either going to go out too hard and he was going to die or, um, he was going to run away from the whole field. So I decided to go with him cause I was feeling good. I didn't see any splits until about 3k, but at, right after 2000 meters, it was like, okay, I still feel good, but I can't hold this. I let him go. And then Alex Musai from Hofstra cut off to me and I saw he was catching up to Kiv too. And I realized, okay, like the field is gaining, is about to pass me. I'm going to go with him. I'm going to go with Hot, the Alex Musai from Hofstra. So I went with him. We hit, um, we hit the top of a hill right before you go down into a dip and then up to 3k and they dropped me <laughs> plain and simple i i couldn't keep up no and knowing that like i couldn't keep up knowing that i would have to run another 7000 meters after that point so after 3k i was 2 seconds behind them and i had in my mind i was like okay just got to run and not worry about what's happening behind me not worry about what's happening in front of me just know it's going to play out as time goes on um, and then around just past 4k, uh, Adrian wild shoot comes up to me and we're not that far away from Wesley Kip too. And Alex Masai and Adrian turns to me and he's like, Hey, like, let's work together. We can catch these guys. And so we switched lead the lead, um, a couple of times. So, cause we were heading up a long hill and it was into the wind. And so we kept switching the lead and then eventually we started catching him at a 5k and then Wesley Kip 2 goes. And it was like, crap, like we just worked this whole course up this giant hill to catch up. And he put another like 30, 40 meters on us just out of nowhere. And so we just keep working. And then um, right after the first, as you're going on the home stretch of the second loop, there's a left turn that goes right into the wind and it's just awful. And so I went uh, to catch up to him at that point. Cause I could tell when I looked up that him running into the wind, he was struggling. And so I caught up to him there just about six or seven K. And then um, I think Alex Musai dropped off some time here. And then it was just Adrian, me and Wesley Kip too. And we were going back and forth, going back and forth. And I just knew that I was feeling really good at that moment. But I told myself, like, don't show your cards till 1,000 meters to go. Like, once you hit the bottom of that hill, that's when you make your move. Because this is a really brutal course and nobody wants to be um, kicking. You don't want to kick early and fall apart. And so I kept telling myself that. And then I would take the downhills pretty hard because we'd, we'd act in it like the weeks leading up to the meet, um, my teammate Casey Klinger and I had done a lot of uh, repeat 800s where we'd gone uphill and downhill and Casey would always drop me on the downhill. So I knew I needed to work on that. And so I was just every downhill I went down, I put a little gap on them and they catch back up. And I think about um, right after 8K, getting close to the 9K mark, we go down this hill and somebody from SUU yelled at me that I had a second and a half on the, on the guys behind me. And so I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm already ahead now. I'm about to make my move into the wind. I might as well go early. Um, so I went early. I tried, I put in a large surge, didn't look back, just kept pressing, just kept pressing. And then I probably was 600 to I looked back and saw, no one was close and it was kind of a moment of unbelief. It was like, Oh, like, where are they? Like these guys were right on my tail. And I was like, you know, like at the time I was in a lot of pain, but it was, I knew that I was in a lot of pain, but I knew that these guys are good. The NCAA like has so many good athletes that you, if you let up, somebody can catch you. So I just kind of focused on grinding, focused on pushing up that hill focused on what I could control. If I, if I faded, like I faded, whatever, but I just, um, was not going to let myself like wait or not give my all. 
um, until it was finished. So I kept pressing, kept pressing. And then it was just cool to like look back before um, I made the last turn and just see this huge gap and be like, okay, I've won this. Like just press, just keep pressing down the hill and enjoy it. And it was just kind of a surreal moment. Um, and then after I finished, obviously exhausted as can be, I tried to look and find my teammates. And then it, it became a, a very bittersweet day because my teammates did not race well. Um, I think the only one who wasn't having a mediocre performance for the majority of the race ended up being the guy who passed out with like 500 left. So it was not a great day for our men's team, but um, I had my best day, which was very nice. So you win, you win what you can, and you sometimes you don't, you can't win all the time. So, so, you know, given the course and how it's uh, really a true cross country course, it's very challenging and hilly. Were you surprised with how quick the race went out or uh, does the course almost force you to go out hard? I was, I was very surprised. Um, we did have the wind at our back and we were, um, it, it is like downhill at that first part and cross country courses always go out fast because everybody wants good positioning, but I didn't think it would go out that fast. It did feel like I was going all out, like sprinting for a long time. And it was like, why, like, okay, and like, when do people slow down and get in a rhythm? When do people slow down and get in a rhythm? And it didn't feel like that happened until probably like a mile in that we like slowed down and kind of got into a rhythm. So, so. what was, uh, what was your strategy or your team's strategy uh, for the race? I know NAU, uh, they seemed very focused on pack running and trying to secure the team championship but what would what was your strategy um my strategy was just make sure i had a lot at 1000 meters to go um make sure i was in that moment like calm and collected trying to you know i wanted to make sure i was i was in the right spot with a thousand meters to go um in the lead pack and then make sure I'm also like collected at that point. So just try to run, run the tangents, run behind people when we're running into the wind. But I think um, it was mainly just get out well and then, you know, focus on, there are a few things, but like one of them was just focus on the moment and how I feel. Do I feel like if I go with Wesley Kipti, I can keep going. For some of it, it was like, yeah. And then some of it, it was like, no. So I tried to adjust accordingly. Um, I knew the course is brutal, so it was like make sure on the uphills and the downhills I'm I don't like push too hard. Make sure I use the downhills to my advantage, and for the uphills I make sure I'm moving. But I'm not going to be so tired at the top I can't like I can't speed up. So just trying to pace it well, I think was more of my strategy. Um, our team strategy was get out hard like we did the year beforehand, but. Um, I think with how fast the race went out, that just hurt a lot of guys on our team who weren't ready for that. So um, you said this earlier, but you are coached by uh, the legendary Ed Eyestone Olympian. How would you describe his training philosophy and uh, what is it like to have him as a coach? His training philosophy is very much um, based on you, you need to be self-motivated to be coached by Ed Eyestone. It's kind of a, a joke or a nickname that the team has for him is they call him Easy E or sometimes just Easy. This is like a nickname because he's so laid back. If you want to succeed, he'll help you to succeed. If you're not willing to succeed, he'll like, he'll give you time and time again to try it. But, um, if you're not running well, he's going to kick you off the team. Like, he, or maybe not kick you off. He's going to have to cut you. That's a better word, right? <laughs> cut oh, rather than kicking off. Um, but he's very, very relaxed. Uh, one thing that, like, you, you said, like, what's it like? Or, like, 
what's it like being coached by him? It's honestly one of the coolest things because I know not only has he coached people as good as me, but he's also been better than me. Um, you think about it, he was, I think, eighth or seventh at the World Cross Country Championships his senior year of high school or college. Um, he's one of the best, you know, cross country runners in, in American history. Um, he was one of the of his time. He was one of the best track runners. He was one of the he was the best road runner for years. He was just consistently good all around. And so, because he's been there, he's you know, he ran professionally probably till he was like thirty eight or thirty nine. He's like the Dathan Ritz nine of his area. And so to be coached by him, it's, it's awesome. Cause it's like, he knows what it's like to be in the situation. He knows what it's like um, to perform on the day. He knows what it's like to have a bad race when you're in really good shape. Um, even though he only had that happen maybe a few times in his career, he still has like, he, he has a lot of stories and expertise that I don't think every coach has. I also think for me personally, it's, it's great because he has, you know, the same faith I have. Um, and I think that's good for me because it's like, you know, for me, I don't run on Sundays, um, or I don't, I won't, I, yeah, I won't run on Sundays for the most part. And he never ran on Sundays for the most part. And so it's nice to have someone there who, you know, coaches you, who has the same beliefs. I think it'd be hard for me to you know, train under a coach who's like, yeah, you got to run on Sundays or they'd say, okay, let's try to modify your training, but they're not really sure how we are not running seven days a week. And so that's another great thing about Coach I Stone. But overall, I would just say for his knowledge is, and his experience is what sets him apart from other coaches. And from what it sounds like, he is really good at building team chemistry. And you did just mention uh, uh, not running on Sundays. And <clears throat> again, there was another <laughs> debate on Let's Run about whether uh, LDS runners are allowed to run on Sundays and how many of them do. Uh, would you care to put that debate to rest? Yeah, um, I, I'll give any information. I'm pretty open. Um, I think in the last, like, probably three or four years, I've ran on 10 day twice, just like to get my legs good shake out before a race. But I do it more of a, I try to make sure I'm not like too, um, I'm in the right mindset. I think the way I see it is, you know, I running kind of takes me away from, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this when I'm running or doing like recreational activities, my mind isn't focused on God or the savior. Um, but when I am running on, um, every other day of the week, it, you know, it's fine. But on Sundays, you know, we, we take it as the Sabbath and it's a very special day for us. So most of us won't run on Sundays. A few, a few guys will. And, you know, it's, um, we're given the, we're given agency. We're, um, the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints faith. We believe that, you know, one of the greatest gifts God gives to man is the ability to choose. And it's like, you know, if you believe you can, you know, still be close to God and train on sun and like on Sunday and completely train on Sunday, like that's great. For me, it's kind of hard for me to have that same focus. And so, and most of the guys are on that same way. Um, we take the Sabbath as a day of rest. I'd probably say there's maybe two or three guys on the team that'll do occasional runs on Sunday, but I don't think, um, I think for the most part, nobody, or for the most part, the majority of the guys don't run on Sundays. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. And uh hopefully now the debate will be ended and people won't have to speculate, but you've already qualified for the Olympic trials in the 5k is your main focus going to be the 5k or are you going to be hoping for a 10k? The 10k for sure. The 10k has kind of always been um, 
like as far as track goes, uh, maybe not always. I love the 5K as well. Um, I don't know. I think the 10K is what I'm going to be focused on for this for these Olympic trials. I think Coach Eyestone and the team is just able to um, train me in a better way for the 10K. The 5K is a difficult event this year, especially with how good the and how deep the U.S. is. I mean, the U.S. is so so deep in every event, but I'd say the 5K is going to be a harder team to make. And so my main focus is on that 10K. I think it's an event that placed my strengths more than the 5K does. So I'm going to be focused on the 10K. If I don't make it in the 10K, then I'm going to tell you I'm a 5K runner until the fi- until the trials are over. So, yeah. All right. So one more question before the rapid fire segment. Um, this is probably the question you've gotten asked uh, the most, but what is next? Will you be leaving college uh, this year and going pro? I, I want an answer to that too. Uh, I still have another year before I graduate, so I'm going to be focused on um, just, I just finished my studies, so that was nice. So I have one more year from today, I think, till I graduate. So I'm not going to leave school. I'm not going to drop out to go run pro, but if an opportunity presents itself, which I think technically under NCAA rules, I can't even figure out. So um, to run pro while I'm here, I'd, I'd probably want to take that, but um, I know coach, I, I'd love to still be coached by coach I stone, but I don't want to like, I'm not necessarily looking to limit myself. So I don't know. That's probably the be- the best answer um i i do i would like to probably go pro sometime this year whether it be after track season or after cross country season in the fall but it's just difficult to really know the future and you know if i had a crystal ball to know the best time to go pro to get the best contract um that would be awesome but for now um i just i've been talking to a few of the pros that train with us like jared ward or clayton young connor mcmillan and they're all um, recommending to wait for a bit. So I don't know. I, yeah. I want to know, but I, I also noted that you can't think about it too much or you're going to race like <laughs> you're going to race like crap. So I'm uh, I'm just going to wait it out for another month or two and then try and figure it out. Yeah. And you never know what will happen at the uh, the trials this year. And uh, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm really excited to see what happens. But now on to the rapid fire questions, a segment I call the bell lap. Uh, Are you ready? All right, let's go. So you are a mechanical engineering major. What uh, What are your career aspirations outside of running? Um. I eventually want to get a master's degree in mechanical engineering and possibly a PhD. I'd love to study. I do some research with um, a PhD student who's doing stuff in the medical field currently, and I'd love love to get more into that. What shoes do you train in and what shoes do you race in? So currently we're in Nike school, so I train in the Nike Pegasus um, for racing. Uh, last couple of races I've raced in the dragonflies. Uh, you have a few siblings and do any of them run? And if you have younger siblings, can we expect to see another man's national title? That, that would be great. Um, my sister currently runs for Utah State University. Uh, she just had a compound fracture through her tibia. Her tibia, I get them mixed up. Um, so she is out for a bit, but who knows, maybe, but she, she likes running. I don't think she takes it as competitively as I do. So I don't think so, but you never, I don't want to sell it short. So what are things that you enjoy doing besides running that people might not expect? People might not expect. I don't know if there's anything I do that people might not expect. I play a lot of guitar. That, uh, 
that's it. <laughs> um, what is your go-to gas station snack? Oh, gas station snack. I don't know, probably beef jerky. Um, last question. Now this one is very important. Okay. All right. So, um, have you ever eaten at Taco Bell? And if so, what is your favorite item? Um, uh, I've eaten at Taco Bell more times than I probably, um, would care to admit. I don't know. I, I'm a, I like the simplicity of a bean and cheese burrito. I like it. That's probably the best answer so far. Uh, a lot of the people that I've interviewed uh, this thus far have not even uh, eaten at Taco Bell before. So, you know, that's great that you have. Yeah, man. Uh, when in high school, I ate there all the time, because, you know, if you only have like two bucks in your pocket, like that buys two bean, or at the time, about two bean and cheese burritos. I think the price has gone up now, but yeah, man, and yeah. then that's a meal. Yeah, that dollar menu is very good. <laughs> it goes far for for a poor college or poor high school student. Right. Well, Connor, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated all the uh, answers that you get, uh, gave us. And um, I look forward to watching you uh, this track season. Hey, thanks, Parker. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to subscribe if you have not already. It really does help out a lot. Live life to the max. Run to the max. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.